Welcome back to Division One Rejects, episode 170 on the night of July 22nd. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. Tonight, not one, but two great guests. Wayne Cavati is back on the show. For those of you who don't know, probably, I mean, goes by the dean of D2. D2 it says enough about him. He is uh, one of the best voices when it comes to small school sports football in particular. He is the man behind the Lindy's preseason rankings from Lindy's Sports Magazine that we posted uh, out on our socials a little while back. And uh, that's actually what we're talking with him about today. Are those preseason rankings a lot of D2 football talk uh, with Mr. Cavati today? I'm excited about that one. And then later in the episode, Joseph Liebrandt joins us. The running back from Roosevelt is uh, not only... Playing or played rather for Team USA, the U20 team that went up and unfortunately got beat a few times there by Japan, I guess most notably. But uh, also is the man that put D1R into EA's college football game, which is pretty sweet in itself. So excited to have him on, talk all about that uh, Team USA experience up there in Canada. They played in the Edmonton Elks Stadium, that CFL squad up there. And uh, also talking about Roosevelt making the jump to Division Two, their first GLIAC game at Ferris State in Big Rapids against, you know, arguably one of the top teams in the country. So great uh, two conversations today. Otherwise, not a whole lot of stories to add on to it. Just typical offseason as usual. As always, watch the episode on YouTube. Hello. Use the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the uh, screen right there. Those are also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to this episode right in the description. So appreciate you guys tuning in. That'll be uh, just about all from me solo-wise this episode. Let's get into those two guest conversations. Join the show tonight. One of the best consistent voices in D2 football and other sports for that matter. Some call him the Dean of D2, but he's back on D1R tonight. Wayne Cavati, what's going on, man? Ah, uh, nothing, man. Thanks for having me. It's uh, I can't believe it is time to talk football. It, it's crazy how quickly this has creeped up on us. It does feel kind of ridiculous, but as someone who, you know, obviously you get it week in, week out, doesn't stop, I'm, I'm glad because uh, you can only look at who has the best uniform in college football graphics so many times uh, before I'd like to start talking about real football again. Yeah, yeah, and that's where we are. Uh, you know, it's crazy. It, it's it's much harder in the current state of football on all levels with the transfer portal and teams jumping all around and, you know, regions and everything. But uh, I guess it makes it more fun. It makes preseason <laughs> rankings and, and, and predictions a little more challenging, but it it's makes it more fun and you really got to pay attention these days. Absolutely. That's uh, I'm right with you there, although it does complicate a lot of things, especially on, on our end, trying to at these lower levels to keep up with everything that's going mm -hmm. on that isn't maybe as publicized. Um, and that's what, you know, we're really excited about uh, hopefully partnering here with Athlink to try and get a lot of that information when it comes to the transfer portal and those kind of things. But uh, tell me about what's been keeping you busy when it comes to D2 sports out of season for football. Obviously not the only sport you cover. Yeah, well, uh, you know, this weekend was the MLB draft. So we, we saw 13 players uh, get drafted, um, which, awesome. you know, with the um, – it used to be in, like, the 50s, but it used to also be almost uh, more than 30 rounds. You know, so since it's been cut back to 20, we're, we're happy to see those 13 go. Um, you know, the earliest one that went was uh, in the sixth round, so, that you know, that's great news. I, I don't know how closely you follow baseball, but um, Seaver King was uh, – he was on Wingate for, Wingate for two years, yep. and he went number nine or ten overall, so it was cool. He finished his career with Wake Forest, but it's still cool to see those guys go, especially – you know, they they mentioned the Wingate Bulldogs a couple times, so it's oh, cool yeah. to hear that when you're in the first round. So yeah, that that's been taking up a, a lot of my attention the past uh, couple days, as uh, for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we talk the same thing when it comes to football. I know we were talking about West Florida recently. You throw a name like Austin Reed out there, who mm -hmm. that's where that's where we know him from. And he goes on to the, with the Hilltoppers and, and does his thing. But um, talk about the uh, the D2 report, bringing that back and potentially for those not familiar, what that uh, what that entails, what are your plans are for that? Yeah, so that's my my Substack newsletter. As you know, most of my work goes on NCAA.com um, with TNT Sports. Um, this my Substack. The reason behind it is basically uh, just to go a little more dive deep, you know, deeper dive into baseball and football, and kind of in the in the fall when I'm writing about D2 football on NCAA.com, I could do fall reports on my newsletter for baseball. When I'm writing about baseball in the spring, I could do football reports about spring ball, you know, and just kind of make that all year coverage and really shine some light on the D2 student athlete. Cause, um, you know, a lot of people think, you know, it is cool, right? I get to watch sports. I get to write about it, but it's always been, this is going to be my 10th season as a D2 beat writer. And it's always been about the student athlete. It's always about getting, shining the light on, on people that deserve it, that work their butts off 
and maybe don't get the recognition they deserve because of, you know, where they are, because of television, because you, all you could do is stream or watch on YouTube, to, you know, YouTube streams and stuff. So I that's always been my goal. And that's that's what I do in the D2 report is just get more names out there and more visibility to these guys. I love that. 100 percent with that. And you know, I mean, you've you've seen our stuff, you know, like. I'm not in this for X's and O's at all. I, I could never be a football coach. I don't have a passion for that. What I have really do have a passion for is the storytelling, just the same thing you talk about, of the athletes, right? The stories that maybe aren't even necessarily associated with football. A lot of times it does have to do with some on-field performance. That's always uh, that's always sweetens the deal. But a lot of times what these guys are doing when they're not uh, wearing that helmet, I, I think that's the best part of it, especially at this level and what we get out of this. Yeah. Um, when you talk about you know the streaming things, that's until Flow Sports just eats up every small school in America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, a thing I think is important is, you know, I'm sitting here on your show and I've been on the D2 football guys show. And, and you know, when it comes to baseball, the D2 baseball insider yep. and, and small college basketball, we all it, there's no competition. Right. Yeah. Because we're all in this. Everyone that that covers D2 sports, we're in this for the same thing. And it's what you said. It's to tell the story. It's to elevate the student athlete and get recognition on this guy on these guys. So it, it's fun for me to come on your show because I, you know, I, I respect you guys, what you're doing. You're, you're doing the same thing I I've done. And for a long time, there was us just me and D2 football. And now, now that we got some help and it's great to see you guys doing that. And I, and I, like, I appreciate you having me here and, and you know, it, it's, it's just a great community that we have. Thank you, man. I, and, and I'm right. I'm right with that. And it's never been, you know, you, you're never trying to outdo somebody else in this space for me it's always about outdoing myself and uh what did we do last year what was our last episode what did that look like how can we increase the production value or make that present things better or more importantly just cover more right i think that's always the, the question that people at this level have is how can you cover more you mm -hmm. do a great job of that and on the football side of things one of the toughest things to do in that regard is rankings and at this level, it is nearly impossible to do. If anyone's got to get a good crack at it, it's going to be you. You put them together, the first preseason rankings for D2 football heading into the fall for Lindy Sports Mag. And uh, obviously, everyone totally agreed with where you uh, put their favorite team, correct? Of course. You know, yes. it, it's, a, it's a gift and a curse, right? Yeah. I get to talk about football, and then I get to be yelled at it, right? And that, that's, <laughs> what, that's what rankings do. Um, of course, not everyone agrees, you know, and... One of the things about D2 sports that is always going to make it harder is, is that's what regionalization brings to off-season banter, right? It's You're so focused on your region that when you see a team like Lenore Ryan that finished this, the year in the top four and I have them outside the top ten, yep. you just – why, right? But, you know, when you look at the big picture, they lost their head coach. The, Dwayne McGee was in the transfer portal when I was doing the rankings. You know, you had no idea. He's one of the best running back, if not the best running back in, in – D2, you know, so you have a lot of question marks and that's why I put this out there. So you get to get the ideas in your head and you start understanding why things are kind of looking a little bit different heading into this season. Absolutely. And on a real note, I mean, you and I have talked to talk about what goes into these rankings. And this isn't something for you or your engagement farming, or there's a lot of places that will just throw together rankings just to get clicks because let's face it, this does get clicks. And for me, it's the best case scenario because you go through the actual effort. Um, and I'll say this, like you go through the actual effort of putting this together. I get to just take all those rankings and put them together in a cool graphic. So it's a, it's a win-win for me because I don't have to make the rankings, but I get to post it out and get to post out the hard work that you do. But talking about these rankings, tell me, about what goes into it to make them as comprehensive as possible. Well, first of all, I did text you when with the with the graphic, and I appreciate it because I'm old, I'm a journalist, and I can't do the pretty stuff. So I thank you for <laughs> making it into a graphic. It's good, but it's it's like you said, you know, um, it's a very hard time of year. Kids are still going in and out of the transfer portal, um, and, and I reach out to these coaches, and I and I I I lay it on the line. I'm like, look, I know you probably don't know. Right. Like your spring ball just ended. You you may have just lost a couple guys that were playing for you two weeks ago. So let's do the best we can. Let me know this. I want to know how many starters are back, including too deep. You know, I want to know maybe they don't they're not a starter, but they have the yep. experience because they were on that too deep. And that all takes part of it. And obviously I need to know the stars that are back. You know, I, I need to know those guys. I need to know the big names and um and and just really. After that, it's me deep diving in the schedules and, and seeing, you know, now that there is a week zero, you know, yeah. looking at who these teams are playing and, you know, we're one year away from a super region shakeup that's going to turn everything on its head. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's just looking at that and looking at who these teams are playing early on in the season, you know, Grand Valley state mines, these are all teams that always test themselves early. Um, so that all that stuff plays a part in it, but a lot of it is just talking to coaches and getting as much of, of the info as I can, um, as early as I can and, and hoping that it sticks, (laughs) especially that early. Absolutely. And what the team looks like even now compared to when it is week zero, week one, whenever it is, could be so drastically different. Mm-hmm. But this top five, right, going down the list for those just listening, Harding, Central Missouri, Pittsburgh State, Ferris State, and Valdosta. Looking at those squads, did those guys just, that probably felt right off the rip. How much consideration was there in that? I think uh, the general consensus from a lot of people is... I didn't see many too many arguments about that. Obviously, I had some few disgruntled Laker, Laker fans down there in Allendale, and uh, Mines obviously is in that conversation after a couple runs at the Natty. But those top five right there, it feels like really solid spots throughout the, the top of this list. Was it as easy as it looked? No. <laughs> and, the, and the reason is the two teams you mentioned. Yeah. Obviously, uh, let, let's talk about outside the top five real quick. The Colorado School of Mines, the John Matoka era is over. And, yep. and that was a heck of an era, right? Like, it was insane. But, you know, you look at it and you had Justin Dvorak win um, a Harlan Hill in 2016. You had Isaac Harker in 2018. This is a school that always has big quarterbacks thrown for 3,500, 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns, right? So Evan Foster's coming in and he's got an All-American wide receiver in Max McLeod. That's a big question mark, yep. but there's still Colorado School of Mines. So it was tough to leave him out of the top five. And then you mentioned Grand Valley State. That could be my biggest mistake. They could be as high as number two, right? You you have so many, I think it's nine returners on each side of the ball, but those guys that they lost, you know, like a Kate Peterson, they were not just good players. They were some of the best in D2. That's a big hit. And that's kind of why I had them lower. But then you said you jump back into the top five. All right, Harding. You got Blake De La Cruz. You got Braden Jay, Cole Keelan, and Jalen Spicer back. That's three. I I did the math before the show just so I had it. That's 3,812 yards rushing and 53 touchdowns that are returning. AKA absurd. Absurd. And then we talk about it. If you look at it straight forward, the offensive line has a lot of holes. But if you look at the two deep, they had two offensive lines last year. So did they lose four starters? Yeah. But they have five guys that played a ton of minutes all the way to the national champion, right? Like this is an experienced team. And they were great. They were a great rushing team for years before last year. They erupted and set every record in the world. Yep. That's yeah, not, that's not going anywhere. And you talk yeah. about the system, too. I think that's it's very important in this role in that if just for sake of the example, the number two team, if Central Missouri loses, say, three starting offensive linemen, that could mean a very different thing than a Harding who is running a very, very different offensive scheme mm. uh, and where you're not maybe relying, not that the offensive linemen do not have to go make plays because you, you could argue that they have to make the most plays and be the most athletic in a system like that. But uh, it, it's just very different in the way they fit into that and maybe aren't as relied on as individuals. It's more of that, you know, doing your 111th. But that's a that's a whole other mm. rabbit hole and, and kind of continuing to go down that list. You look at a team like Central Washington at number eight, and I know a lot of people maybe on the outside thought the Wildcats uh, out west there, they were kind of a one-and-done deal this playoffs. They surprised a lot of people down there in the Lone Star. You're pretty high on them heading into 24? Tanner Volk is, is going to be defensive player year. You know, I mean, that guy is amazing, and oh, yeah. he charges. It's not just what he does. Everyone else plays with him, right? You got to keep up with your best defensive player. So, um, and plus, you know, it was the way they were winning ball games. Uh, it, it was impressive. They were they were in dog fights with some really good teams, and they didn't relent. Sometimes they were. It looked like they were down and out, and they just they they hung in there. And I just like that. And they have enough returning, of course. Like everybody in, in D two, you lose a lot every year. Um, but they have enough returning. And again, you know, a guy that I have pegged as a defensive player of the year um, and a Harlan Hill candidate, which if you know about Harlan Hill, like you just defenders don't win that. There's been one in the entire history, but this guy is that good. What do you have, like 13 interceptions last year or something? The guy's amazing. And then you talked about it. I I can't remember what he did, but on Twitter, the guy's like all American, like not Football wise, like human. the best human being in the world. Absolutely. Right? Like, 100%. It's like, yeah. how are you not rooting for this guy? If, I, if I'm correct, looking back at it correctly, I'm going to have to pull it up to, to fact myself. I believe it was a bone marrow transplant. Yes. Yes. That's what I saw. Yeah. I mean, that's the guy's awesome. just amazing. Um, that so, might yeah, be number so, seven worthy. I'm just saying. 
<laughs> right <Not> there. <laughs> but on the football field, he's also the best, uh, yeah. probably DB in the nation. Um, so, yeah, I just think that it was the way they won, the experience they got. And then the, the people they have coming back were key people. And I think that's a big deal. Yeah. And now when you look at this list, I guess in particular, and you talked about how this landscape has changed so much with the transfer portal and, and the other things that have uh, been, you know, annexed into the college football landscape. Is there a team on here that has benefited a lot from that transfer portal and that maybe you uh, you weighed that a little bit higher with them and that you think they're really getting some playmakers that'll come in and make a difference right away in the fall? I think Slippery Rock getting Lawrence at running back from Notre Dame um, was huge because we know that uh, uh, Long is going to chuck it. We know they oh, they're, they're We could call them wide receiver you, right? They have a wide receiver every year. Uh, that that's amazing. We know the passing game is not going to be anything. When you bring in the balance of a guy that could rush for, I think, you know, he only played nine, eight or nine games last year and still had nearly 1,200 yards. This guy is lethal. I mean, you're talking about one player. Plus, they brought in a tight end, uh, uh, and I think it was a backup tight end. They brought in someone else. I, I just think it, they're, they're making an impact. I know Central Missouri brought in a wide receiver because, you know, they got to – replace a, a big wide receiver their number one um yep, from last Marshall year so, yeah so they got it they brought in a wide receiver so i think those guys made that those two teams made a lot of moves but really i mean it's so tough to say because you know when i'm making these rankings i haven't seen how they they mesh i could look at it on paper and say oh this team got three d1 guys but What's that mean if they're not that meshing, you know? And that that's something like a Ferris State has always done. They've been able to bring in a guy and it's like, look, we're going to give you a chance to win it all, but you got to play Ferris State football. And they do. That's not always the case, right? And, and so I, I don't know if it's – I don't do the on-paper winners or losers until we get closer to the, the opening game in the transfer portal. But I do think that Lawrence addition to Slippery Rock's running game is just going to be um, insane. I would definitely uh, tend to agree, and we can just stick right on Slippery Rock here. And some big news that we got uh, just earlier today in the D2 football world. Now, it'll be a little while back when this airs on Monday, but uh, Kyle Sheets, man, signing a deal, getting it done with the Kansas City Chiefs. He was picked up uh, as undrafted free agent by the Saints, now finally inks a deal with the defending Super Bowl champions. Tell me about uh, your immediate reaction to this one. Uh, I was psyched. Uh, my old um, D2 Nation podcast host, Bethany Bowman, uh, she now covers the Chiefs. So I told okay. her to go stalk him tomorrow at training camp. So we'll have more information <laughs> hopefully in the coming days. Good. Um, but, you know, it's a it's a great look. He's he's I think he's listed at six foot four, you know. And so that means when in D2, you're anywhere six, two to six, five. Right. Like when yep. they say you're six, four. That's a huge advantage in D2. He he was like full helmet over most of the guys that were covering him. And that's still a big advantage in um the football in the National Football yep. League, too. You know, uh, he's got the size. He I think his combine was about 4.5 40, you yep. know, which is not you're not lighting it up, but you have separation skills, which we saw because he was that deep threat all the time. You know, he's not gonna win win the race, but he's gonna get separation and he's gonna get downfield and he's gonna get open and he's got those quarter those hands that quarterbacks love. He can make um contested catch grabs. He can make like he doesn't just drop balls. Like he has soft, strong hands that, that catch everything. And if we look at the landing spot, it's much better than the Saints, right? The Chiefs have, you know, the Rice situation is going to be weird. I know they signed Hollywood Brown, but I also have a fantasy football podcast. If you look at Hollywood Brown's numbers, he's one of those guys that gets the big plays and it really inflates it. Like he's not a good catch percentage based on target type of guy and, and Sheets is and – you know, there's going to be opportunity there. And I know they have a deep wide receiver room, but they're already talking about Kadarius Tony getting cut. Yep. You know, Hardman um, is is not like a, a mega star or anything. So, uh, you know, he came, he got, like you mentioned, he, he got cut by the Saints. He came, he, he practiced, they signed him to a deal. They saw something they liked. So I think it's, a, I mean, and you got Patrick Mahomes throwing you the football. You're, you're going to succeed, you know? So I think it's a great landing spot and, it you know a heck like you said by the time this airs but a heck of a 48 hours for him you know go, showing up at chiefs camps and, and then getting added to the roster 
I hope so, too. That, that seems to definitely be the way this is trending. I mean, you look at last year for him, 76 catches, almost 1,200 yards, 17 touchdowns. And, yeah, listed at 6'4", 220. You go down that list of the Chiefs wide receivers, not typically one that you associate with these kind of big targets, right? Some of those names that you mentioned. Outside of Justin Ross uh, on that depth chart, at least from what I could find, they don't have a, a dude with this kind of physical makeup. That, that is Kyle Sheets. Mm-hmm. And so now it'll be interesting to see how he fits into that offense. But, again, when you're a guy who's built like that and there's not many other humans, especially uh, on that squad that's built like that, how do you see him fitting into to this offense and, and kind of earning his stripes? You know, I mean, it, it will all come down to, like, real training camp and everything. Like, right now, it's, you know, it, it's what can you do? Well, let's see your physical attributes. Yep. But it, it's like I said, it, it's an ideal situation. And, and you know, it's a – he's going to have a chance. The Chiefs don't shy away from starting – it's not like they, they've won Super Bowls with all pros at every position, right? They they had Jody Fortson from Valdosta State at, backing up Travis Kelsey for years. He's got a Super Bowl ring to show for it, you know, like – the, the Chiefs don't shot. If, you, if you're going to catch a ball from Patrick Mahomes, they're going to play you. And, and that's yeah. what Kyle Sheets does. And, and I think he'll just be um, – I think – look, I don't, I don't think he's uh, the next Adam Thielen right off the bat. But he has that <laughs> kind of – you know, he has that kind of trajectory to him that he could be a trusted guy that hangs around for a couple years – does exactly what he do- needs to do and then gets that number two wide receiver opportunity. And all of a sudden everyone's like, Oh, the D two kid from, you know, and, and from slip little slippery rock. And, and I, that's just how these stories start. You, you earn your time, you, you earn your trust of the quarterback and, and he's in a situation that, you know, I'm not saying go out and draft him in your fantasy football league in the fourth round, but <laughs> we're definitely keeping an eye on him. Like, I think it's a great fit. Yeah. And then we get to go through this all again of, there's really a school named Slippery Rock, and that would be all over the place. I love – I mean, we get a cycle every once in a while, I feel like, when one of these guys goes and does something great because the athletics in general down there in Pennsylvania, that's just – they're on another level, especially when it comes to the Rock. So um, yeah. I'm excited about that, but really thankful for you joining me tonight, man. I think that's all I got for you as it comes to the rankings and, and as far as Kyle Sheets goes. But thank you for your continued coverage, being a great voice in this space. Always a pleasure to, to have you on here, and it won't be the last time. All right. Thank you. I always appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Have a good rest of your night, man. Join the show tonight. He's a running back, the newest member of the GLIAC, Roosevelt University down in Chicago. Coming off playing with U20 Team USA in Canada, he's also the man that put D1R into EA College football, Joseph Lee Brandt. What's up, dude? What's up? Excited to get you on here, man. We are uh, literally in the game because of you. That is so sweet in itself. Thank you. It looked, it looked awesome. Thank you. I loved it, dude. Not time on it. Did you? Yeah. How much like time and effort goes into doing something like that in Team Builder, and how much customization do you get with all those pieces? I, my brother's got the. I don't even have. I just got still got the PS4, dude. I haven't even upgraded to a next gen console yet. Gotta get that going. I need to. But how much customization do you have? How much time and effort goes into that in the Team Builder side of things? Uh, I mean, it's a pretty quick like as long as you know like some details. Obviously, like. When I made my my college team Roosevelt and it, it took a decent minute because there's a lot more details to iron out. Like I think I had to go through my uniform at least like three or four times because one we have like five different combos. And I'm yeah. like, oh, dude, this helmet's black, face mask not green, so I just had to keep changing it, stuff like that. But when it came to doing D one R, it was like I had full autonomy to basically do what I want. Hell just yeah. Had- there's no there's no uh, reference work we don't we don't have any jerseys made or anything yeah. obviously you got the you got the black helmet with the red face mask that's about like all you had to to go off of i think yeah. that is so, hilarious i need to get this i'll get this downloaded up there on uh on little brother's uh ps5 up there i need that i need that for sure um you put roosevelt in there too like you said the jerseys were i mean i haven't seen them in person but obviously from everything i've seen on twitter and, and sorts of that nature it looked like the jerseys were just about exact to how they look in real yeah. life uh, it, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, I had my head coach actually text me about having his son download it, how to download it. And I had to walk him through it. So that was a little cool moment for me. Then those were the actually like third time I had to do the jerseys because I couldn't <laughs> get the color match correct because first couple days of Team Builder EA, it's just like it wouldn't color match correctly. Yeah. So I kept loading it in the game. I'm like, I can't post these yet. So then I just got it down. I was like, I think North Central had a great build, so I like loaded that up because it was our week one last year. So I'm like, I'm like, man, this looks like game film almost. When I went to like broadcast angle, I was like, I got it. Yeah, 
Dude, that's so sick. Um, and that's – people have been blown away by that too. Going back, like you said, like the broadcast or like the replay kind of deal, like the, those perspectives and stuff in there are awesome. Uh, they're hilarious. And I've loved uh, – we'll talk about it a little bit later in the show, but now just scrolling through Twitter now is like every team it feels like in America is, is – uh, uh, not usually doing it themselves, but trying to find one kid on their team, like you said, that'll sit down and just put about, you know, six to eight hours into just making their team into EA college football. That is, uh, that is pretty cool. But let's talk about your time with, uh, with Team USA. The boys over there come under quite a bit of fire here in the last month uh, from a lot of different spots. But tell me, tell me about your experience being there doing that instead of me just starting to blab at someone from the outside. What was that experience like for you? I mean, it was obviously a great experience. Like the whole time, got to go out, go new country, go to, go up in Canada, Canada, well during the week of the NHL finals. So the whole yeah. city was buzzing up in Edmonton. So a lot to do up there. Obviously, we had to be smart. Had a lot of underage guys on the team being U twenty two, so we had to keep that in because Canada, a lot of stuff you can do up there that you can't do here. So yep. it was a lot about staying focused all week for sure. Like going throughout. Then obviously this. First time I played three games in 12 days ever. That was Damn. my body definitely took the toll on that one. But I feel great now, which is obviously coming out of healthy was for the college guys who were on team were probably the biggest outcome everyone wanted besides so winning. Not only there were uh, some guys that weren't college players, you're talking like because it's U20. So like you still had some, some high school guys in that roster? Yeah, yeah. Basically, I would consider everyone that's either a senior, freshman, or sophomore. But we had a couple guys rolled out before our first game against Panama because of their age restrictions. Really? Basically what it was, we had Charles, which was the director, basically send the roster weeks before to the IFAF, which was the International Federation of American Football. They cleared that roster, but then we had a couple guys get up. It was supposed to be our starting quarterback and three-star Bryce Williams both got rolled out right before the game. Yeah. It basically went made our roster go from 36 to 34. Which is already supposed to be a forty-five man roster, but a lot of guys had passport issues. Like I almost was able not to play because I had to get an emergency passport appointment because it's just not something U.S. kids do right away. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I I totally get you there. Now, what was your first impression? Uh, you show up for that that practice one or whatever. When it comes to, like the skill level of the guys that you were playing with, even though there were only what thirty four, thirty five other uh, dudes on that squad, what was your impression of uh, the skill level with those guys? I mean, everyone definitely was there to get better. Obviously, there's, like, we're not sending Arch Manning over, stuff like that. Like, I know Patrick has <laughs> touched on that. Don't, don't worry, we heard that all week, but we were out there, too. But, I mean, a lot of guys, we're, we're the ones that made the commitment. And, I mean, I would say the majority of the roster was D1, D2 guys, but, like, D1 committed or going D2. Then, obviously, then Matt Jung, which was a D3 All-American last year on D3 football, he was probably our best defensive player. Okay. But then just roster wise, like I had to play a little defense just because you had 34 guys Dude, and yeah. I haven't played consistent defense probably since junior year of high school. But I'm like, you got to be a special teams contributor, contributor too. So I'm like, this is just more tackling reps for me, reading holes. It's like going down on kickoff. It's just another way to do it. So I'm like, and my awesome. linebacker coach for USA was actually at Roosevelt the year before. So we already had that connection. Okay. It was a cool experience, just that. No, but everyone was there to get better. I won't say there was like, quote bad players like some people were saying it was yeah 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 because i think that's the impression from the outside right is like there's there's some guys that like just get in there for whatever odd reason and, and like you said it's not like we took uh the ap fbs first team all americans yeah. and sent that group over there but at the same time this group is not full of slouches right these are all dudes who are like really passionate about this and you think of yeah. the age group too um it's a u20 team you're not sending over these fifth and sixth year covid guys that have been in college uh for again six seven years yeah. going on their their last year of eligibility so i think that has to the people forget to take that into account for sure uh what'd you take out of that trip you said three games 12 days what'd you learn and through that process especially when it comes to taking care of your body because that is in the American football perspective, that's ridiculous. I mean, so me personally at Roosevelt, I was a redshirt the last season, so I didn't yep. quite have that game. Basically, it was my first time game action since senior year. Yeah. So then going thrown in the fire like that, I think I was I, – I just kept thinking about what my head coach said to me and other coaches on Roosevelt staff. They're like, make sure you stay healthy during it. I was probably in the training room every single day possible. Just so we, I'll say our trainers, world-class for U20s. They're probably some of the best trainers in my career. They kept everyone very healthy. Um, then other stuff I really took away from it, 
man, football has gotten better across the globe. It's not like 10 years. Like people are like, how'd you lose to Japan? I'm like, Japan got guys like I'm like almost want to text our coach about type thing. Like <laughs> That's these, awesome. are some, yeah. these are some dudes, dude. Like I faced like Juliet, Juliet Catholic in high school, powerhouse, Illinois, St. Francis, Illinois powerhouse. I'm like, man, this, they, they look like a JV team compared to what I just played. And I was like blown away almost. Then you had Panama, Panama had, they, I won't even call them really a bad team, but they were just unexperienced, which you saw. But Japan, they have leagues over there. Austria, they have a pro league over there too. So and I'm like, so one of the Japan guys was actually, is going to be a D1 player with one of the players that's going to be D1 on our team. So they like talk to each other. That was like cool experience. They started trading jerseys, stuff like that. That's so sweet. like from the outside, it's like a lot of crap game thrown. Like I think you had Tyreek Hill even saying stuff about it. But then like when you're experiencing, I'm like, man, it was a great experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, now you get to be on the outside looking in at the uh, Team USA basketball team that needs to hold off South Sudan on a buzzer beater and then apparently just had a really close run in with, like, Germany. Um, yeah, and, man. yeah, I saw that. Right? So now you're like... I, I got to admit, part of me is happy seeing that. I'm like, dude, we're not the only one. <laughs> That's, what I'm, saying. That's what I'm saying, yeah. We're sending over the literal dream team when it comes to the NBA and these guys are still in uh, some pretty close match with these guys. It's uh, get the monkey off your back, uh, so to speak. That's awesome. Um now, this doesn't mess with your NCAA eligibility at all, right? So what kind of hoops did you jump through to do that? Was just working with your compliance officer at your school? Yeah. What, what did that entail? So I, I just called my head coach, made sure we got all cleared with the compliance through our compliance, had to get confirmed through the NCAA again, which obviously, like, Roosevelt, we're, we're being, like, double-checking everything right now because we're in the provisional period. Yeah, so, oh, so yeah. Got to make sure. I'm Googling everything, reading through the bylaws, and it's like, I'm looking at paths, but like, I'm like, I'm not messing with my eligibility on this. I'm like asking the coach on the staff that I already knew. Yeah, I'm like, oh, the other college guys. I'm like, it's got cleared by other colleges. I'm good. It's so since it's sponsored by, and it's technically amateur games, and it's sponsored by the Paralympic and Olympic Committee, okay. it was okay. So it, it falls under Olympic classification. Really? That. I didn't know that. Because uh, there's no Olympic equivalent of football besides yeah. this. So it's like hand in hand with USA football. Holy shit. I had no idea. That's actually, that's really sweet. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Cause you have the whole amateurism kind of idea that's now being thrown out the window because now we're talking about potentially like, yeah, like, I mean, you have guys trying to figure a lot out. You're just trying to make sure you slip up. They're sending your whole squad back to NAI. You can't have that. Um, but no, they would just punish you. They wouldn't punish the rest of the guys. Um, but on to Roosevelt though, you guys went six and four last year. Those losses though, to quality teams, North central was one of them. You talked about it, but the other three, I think all three of them were top 25, like nationally ranked squads in NAI and teams that, um, made pretty deep runs and, and had really good success in their conferences. How are you guys hoping to build this year and, and kind of come right to the GLIAC right away and try to compete, man? What's the attitude like? I mean, you just got to focus on ourselves. You can like, even going back to USA, like there's all this outside noise, which I think I have great firsthand experience with. You just got to block it all out. You got to make sure you're going to, you're the one doing everything to your best ability. Uh, how you do anything's how you do everything. And that's just got to be our mantra going into it. Oh, I mean, yeah. you could, we can look at our schedule and it, you, you, we got guys on there. It's not like we're scheduling some 0 and 9, 0 and 10 teams. We're, we're got powerhouse even out of conference. Then we yeah. got obviously yeah. GLIAC, which is arguably the best division two conference. So we're going into it like we're not going to go in and try losing a game and we want to compete every day. Yeah, just be that's half the battle, brother. Just just competing and, and being there for it. Um, but that first Gliat game at Fair State, probably you said maybe their homecoming. Welcome to Division Two. Whoever is putting together that schedule is absolutely not pulling any punches. They're out to get you guys. What the hell? That is that is a crazy trip to Big Rapids for the first uh, first in conference game. It's gonna be t it's gonna be a fun atmosphere though you know that especially like I said if it is homecoming it'll be a fun atmosphere if nothing else. Yeah, I mean it's gonna be a lot of fun for sure. I mean, it, it, in my opinion, it doesn't matter who you're playing. You just gotta go out there do your job correctly still every time. You can point out Fair State's homecoming stuff like that. That doesn't matter to us point blank. Yeah. It, even if they scheduled us week one to week ten, I think we end with Grand Valley. It doesn't really matter. You're gonna play them either way. Yeah, true. Obviously they're throwing a little little punch first Gliac game, but yeah, <laughs> that is true though. It's not like I mean, what what the hell does it matter if it's week one or week five or week seven? It, it, 
doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And it's not like, you know, you guys aren't going to have some really good tune-ups and, and kind of uh, evaluations before then. You open up with Whitewater, then you have uh, a Valpo team that you play against. And uh, Campbellsville, I, I can't say I'm too familiar with their squad, but those first two games are definitely going to be a good test for you guys. So you're not going into this first GLIAC match still not knowing who you are. I mean, by week four of your season like that, you've got a great sense, I would assume, of kind of the team and, and identity. Are you guys still trying to build that over there? How's the... Uh, as far as the, I guess, staff and kind of cohesion on this roster, what does that look like? I mean, I, I think we have a lot more returning guys than most teams for sure because we were okay. pretty young speaking last year. I mean, I would say everyone's committed. I, I love some of the guys we have coming in, some of them texting me on Twitter, stuff like that, being like, hey, do you want to go throw? Stuff like that. Like, that's awesome. Man. Like, that's good. Just having guys coming in like that culture-wise. And I think Coach Williamson does a great job fostering men in the program in terms of making sure we're doing our stuff because – I mean, point blank in Chicago, there's a ton of distractions. Like, yeah. when you come on your come come on your visit, Rose. So like, yeah, you go to Chicago, but then once you get here, you're like, yeah, we're in Chicago, but you gotta do your job. So it's not like we're some middle of nowhere team where it's cornfields left and right. No, you gotta <laughs> do your job, so, dude. There's really good and really bad things that come with that, and and being in Marquette yeah. and playing at Northern. You kind of get a little bit of that where, yeah, Marquette's got enough going on. Like it's a small town, but there's you know there's things happening here. Man, you get outside of Marquette, nothing. Right, nothing. And, and with that is is nice because there's less distractions for guys. Now, being in down like in downtown Chicago, looking at like even just the dorms, for example, for you guys, you're right downtown. What was that like? I'm assuming you stayed in the dorms last year? Yeah, I, I, I actually, I call it the penthouse room because I'm on the 31st floor and I got the same room again. I overlook Soldier Field and Navy Pier for my <laughs> dorm. I mean, listen, I mean, there's no better experience to have. It's just straight a college student. Point blank, you're basically living in a multi million dollar penthouse for it is whatever it is for yeah as yeah. a college football player. I'm like point blank D one, D two, D three, NAI, JUCO, you're not getting that experience anywhere else. That's I mean, I got Bears games spoiled for me when I would have them on TV. I would see the fireworks go off like seconds you're before I would just whip back what happened. It was Oh my gosh, that is awesome. Yeah, like I'm just, you know, you go through some of these pictures yeah, online right and uh, it just doesn't seem real. Are they jacking up the rates on you guys because of that or no? Price-wise. I mean, I, I consider it like, like based on everything, it's reasonable. Fine. I mean, I I know like obviously we're at 36 scholarships. Like a lot of guys aren't really paying the student rate, but at yeah. the same time, you can't get cheaper housing in Chicago than what they're offering to like, yep. you're paying ludicrous prices for whether we have a university center, which is like apartment style. Then we have Wabash building, which is also part of our college, yep. like you have classes in that building. So like, honestly, for what you're getting, can't beat it. It so fun. I mean, I know roommate, we have a roommate group chat for next year. Are you going like, Hey, who's going to bring this, this like credit film area, stuff like that. Like, you have a lot of autonomy about what we want to do out there too. That's nice. That was the biggest question for me when you talk about like being right in downtown Chicago is like one, where the hell are these guys going to stay and where the hell are they going to play? Like what are these, what are these facilities, you know, going to look like? And that, that's been interesting for me to, as I've learned more about you guys now, especially coming into the GLIAC, uh, that's been, that's been pretty sweet. How about that? Uh, you guys were in the Edmonton, it was Edmonton. So it was in the Elk stadium, correct? Yeah. Commonwealth stadium of the Elks for USA that, oh my God. That's pretty legit. I'm for, for I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, CFL is yeah. like falling back behind like XFL. I'm like, man, that stadium's wow. I'm like, I've been at like other D1 stadiums like NIU, stuff like that. I think, oh my God, this stadium was so nice. Probably the best field I've ever played on. Really? Too. All grass, and I assume. Turf. It is but turf. It, it, nice turf. Okay. I mean, I mean, they're that far mean, north. I guess that kind of makes, I don't know, makes sense. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. One, I didn't even mention this one experience just being out there. Like, it didn't get, dark to like two in the morning Holy so be like, i'm like how do you guys live through this i would be like asking like the elks personnel and they're like you just get used to it i mean we met, met all their players i mean i got a ton of gear i'm not even gonna lie like my bank account <laughs> my, ba my bank account i had to check a whole second bag just because of like usa stuff plus elk stuff i was yep. like this is my cfl team now it just has to be that's a good Which, problem to have that's a good that's problem, a problem. To have. and they're a good team to to be behind too. The success yeah, they've the, had. They're the best worst team in the CFL. They lose every game by like three or six. It's insane. That's awesome, dude. And I think the people they forget. I guess first of all, because they're they're pretty far. Is Edmonton pretty far west? 
Yeah, because I had to connect in Denver just to get up yep. there. Okay, so that makes sense. Because then I think of like Alaska, we think of like the, the sun going down at such a ridiculous yep. hour. <laughs> um, but then thinking about the CFL, going back to the stadium, I think what people fail to realize when they compare it to, say, the XFL or some of those, the CFL has history. Uh, oh, yeah. I think that's where people forget that, yeah, the football is, first of all, the football is, is a good product of football there, but the history there is is big time. And that's the reason why they have a lot of this stuff. It's not like the XFL is trying to kind of get their feet, or UFL, sorry, trying to get their feet again and, and you know, almost renting out these stadiums. That, that's not the case up there. Yeah, I mean, our, our coach uh, for USA, Kelly, was a part of CFL for a while. It, he, it was his, one of his old teams, which was called the Eskimos at the time. So oh, it's yeah. Like, created everything in that locker room like it was his old house like boy scouts leave better than you found it which obviously you should do anyway but it was just it gave it for me for sure i mean i actually got a pin that's like the their 75 year thing on my bag i attached like a bunch of keychains clanking around now because it's just yeah there's so much history there and like you just started appreciating it playing in there every day and stuff like that and that's like, awesome yeah that's sweet dude. The field is huge though i got it like they had our american field then they had the CFL field on the outside. Whoa. Big difference. I, would, I, I could not play DB in the CFL. That's all I'm saying. That's, <laughs> and yeah, they get a running nice start. Defense. And running start. It's yeah. Like, man, you're setting defense up to fail, dude. No, that, that's brutal. Um, you're not playing much press man there. But um, that'd be like going – I know like we downsized our, our ice rig up here at Northern from like an Olympic sheet to like a hybrid. Like that's that's probably the even crazier of an of a example than that. Um, a lot of that – you know, that criticism and stuff from you guys came to the coaches. And I think a lot of it, maybe less of it was at the players. What were your interactions with the coaches like? And, uh, you know, what were your impressions of those guys? I mean, I thought the coaches honestly were great on the defense side of ball because that's just where I laid more yep. in special. Like, Coach Lund's awesome. I still text Lund. Like, it was his birthday day. I texted him happy birthday. Over as well. I mean, a defense was set up for success. I mean, offense just had trouble getting stuff going. The Japan and uh, – Austria game, which it, point blank, it happens in football. Just tough time getting going. Don't have a lot of practice under your belt, stuff like that. A lot of chemistry. Then our second quarterback, that was because Mikey Gow went, was ruled ineligible. Then our second quarterback yep. went down. Or Luna was going to like rotate in, but obviously, like a lot of stuff basically just hit the fan right away. <laughs> which I got to say, coaches, you can blame them, stuff like that. It's a hard job getting guys to have passports ready in under a month because that's what they had. And I barely got a passport appointment even. And so then yeah. you have to find 44 other guys to do that. It's a very hard, hard job. That's brutal. That is brutal. But sounds like a, a really sweet experience. Glad you could could be a part of that. And uh, excited to uh, – I'm trying to think. Is Are you guys up here at the Dome this year or is it down in Roosevelt? I have no idea. Gonna be I should. I should. Game, and I have no I clue. You guys played my boy at lacrosse last year, Landon Owen. Oh, yeah? So. Oh, yeah. We had a couple trips down there to lacrosse. That was, that was a fun. We got great relationships with those guys, man. But, um, Joseph, thank you, man. I appreciate you coming on. You know, that's all I got for you today. But uh, thank you for spending Congrats. some time, brother. Yep. Appreciate it. Have a good night.